Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. I'm honored, in fact, to be here at Evanston, Illinois this evening to reimagine and reinvest in a time-honored ritual that takes place at the borders between schools and the communities they serve. I want to explore with you a community that cares deeply about education, the quality and character, the promise and potential of parent-teacher dialogues, those exchanges that I refer to as the essential conversation. As you all know, educators and parents, policymakers and researchers all seem to give lip service, some rhetorical bow, to the great significance of authentic communication between parents and teachers. We all believe in the critical importance of parent-teacher alliances. We all recognize their symbolic and ceremonial significance. And we all aspire to their educational and relational benefits. But we rarely explore the difficult and complex work of building family and school alliances. We rarely examine the explicit and implicit meanings of these encounters. We rarely search out the text and the subtext of this critical ritual between home and school. So this evening, I want to illuminate this central dimension of goodness in schools, the relationship between schools and the families and communities they serve. As a matter of fact, I want to talk specifically about how parents and teachers navigate this often rocky terrain. I want to consider the power and potential, the casualties and opportunities, the casualties and vulnerabilities of the dialogues between parents and teachers. I want to tell you why I think these highly ritualized encounters that we call parent-teacher conferences are critical for parents, teachers, and children. Why these conversations are so anxiously anticipated and layered with trauma and meaning for the participants. Why these dialogues at family school borders are essential for supporting the achievement and success of our children. And I want to suggest ways to make these conferences more meaningful and more productive. I'd like to begin with two autobiographical reflections that open my book, The Essential Conversation, as a way of expressing the passion and personal history that I brought to this inquiry about relationships between parents and teachers. These ancient tales from school also remind us of the ways in which good storytelling allows us to see the general in the particular and allows us to hear the ways that historical narratives get echoed in contemporary practice. So here are two ancient autobiographical tales. When I was seven years old and in second grade at a rural two-room schoolhouse in Apple Orchard Country, northwest of New York City, I contracted an exotic disease called Sydenham's chorea. Difficult to diagnose and rare in young children, the doctors only agreed that I could be treated at home rather than in the hospital because they trusted that my physician mother would care for me with a double dose of doctor's judgment and mother's love. For three months, I stayed home in bed trying to conquer the subtle infirmities of this illness, which expressed itself in the physical symptoms of weakness and dizziness and the emotional signs of anxiety and depression. I was nursed by my maternal grandmother, a former school teacher who brought me trays of food and worked with me on my lessons. My grandmother's homeschooling in these three months was more strict and demanding than any curriculum that I have had before or since. <laughs> my friends were allowed to visit very occasionally, but only if they promised to stay for a few minutes and be very quiet. For a while, I enjoyed all of the attention my parents' solicitousness, my siblings' anxious concern. But very soon, the sedentary, quiet life got very old. I missed my friends. I missed the group life at school, the hustle and the bustle, the scheming and competing, the rules, routines, and public rewards for work well done. And I worried a lot about whether I would lose my place socially and academically. Slowly but surely, I recovered and returned to Mrs. Sullivan's classroom, first for half days, and then weeks later for whole days. 
One afternoon, when my parents came to pick me up early, Mrs. Sullivan walked outside with me to await their arrival, a gesture that made me feel immediately important and anxious. I remember her hard hand on my shoulder as she steered me down the stairs. I recall the way she kept clearing her throat nervously as my parents unfolded themselves from the car and made their way toward us. Her greeting was strictly ceremonial. She moved quickly to her main point. She wanted my parents to know that my three-month absence had severely compromised my academic progress. She did not think that there was any way that I could make up for lost time, that it would therefore be necessary for me to repeat the second grade. But that wasn't the worst of what Mrs. Sullivan had to say. She also thought that my parents had to face the fact that I might, just might not, be college material. <laughs> All of this was said in front of me, actually it was said far above my head, so I had to strain my neck back to look up at her face, her voice stern and hard, her expression flat. I couldn't believe my ears. My heart was pounding hard against my chest. This was shocking news, so unfair, so wrong-headed. I am sure that my parents felt the same way. But what I remember most from this story was not Mrs. Sullivan's wounding words, nor the knot in my belly as I heard them. The most vivid and lasting image was my parents' response a reaction that lacked all of the clarity and courage that I was used to from them. At that moment, they were not their usual strong selves, fiercely advocating for me. They listened, demurred, but didn't disagree, and made a quick exit. All the way home, I waited for their outrage, for their defense of me. Instead, they were silent, probably biding their time until they could find some private moments together, when they could confer and, and come up with an appropriate collective response. By dinner time, they had emerged from my father's study, their expressions upbeat, their outlooks optimistic. They were saying that they knew I was very intelligent, capable of being a great student, and certainly capable of going to college and beyond. They knew that Mrs. Sullivan was wrong, and the best way to prove her wrong was for me to do excellent work. I was not to succumb to her prophecy. I was to challenge it with the best I had. Of course, I rose to my parents' challenge, worked very hard, exceeded all of Mrs. Sullivan's expectations, and I want to tell you, joined my classmates in third grade <laughs> the next year. My parents' primary message to me, a litany that they would repeat at crucial moments throughout my life, was that I was strong and resilient, that I could do anything I set my mind to, that I could even overcome prejudice, malice, and obtuseness with good works. But the other more surprising message that I received from watching that encounter between them and Mrs. Sullivan was that school was a place, perhaps the only place, where my parents seemed off balance and reluctant where their activist instincts didn't serve them well, where it was hard for them to figure out the best way to protect and advocate for their daughter. Many years later, when I was trying to figure out how to protect my own daughter from what I perceived to be a teacher's subtle abuse, I remember my mother telling me that I should not do anything that would make the teacher feel angry or afraid, for that would surely endanger my daughter in her classroom. At that moment, my mind raced back 35 years to my parents' uncommon restraint and passivity in the face of Mrs. Sullivan. I still feel guilty for not having done more to protect you from her, whispered my mother as our memories converged and our minds raced back to 1952. None of this uncertainty and tentativeness was there several years later when my father responded quickly and decisively to my eighth grade history teacher's rendering of an American story about which he was expert and cared deeply. My father was a professor of sociology 
whose scholarship included research and writing on the history of black activism in the South. In my eighth grade citizenship education class, Miss Rogers, her pale face caked with powder, her eyebrows drawn on with black pencil, wisps of white hair escaping from underneath her red wig, taught us that Abraham Lincoln led the country in the war between the states and that the battle had nothing to do with slavery. Her eyes rested on me, the only Negro child in the class, daring me to challenge her interpretation of history. That evening around the dinner table, my parents made the correction. It was the Civil War, and the institution of slavery was at its very center. And I will never forget my father's rage at discovering the word barbarian used to describe the Mayan Indians of Central America in my fourth grade social studies textbook. He could not resist lecturing his children on the extraordinary Mayan civilization, its creativity, organization, and resilience. And then immediately sat down at his typewriter, if those of you out there remember what that was, <laughs> at his typewriter to bang out a restrained but angry letter to my teacher with copies to the principal and the district superintendent. Watching this scene repeated many times over throughout my schooling, I observed the sharp dissonance of values between my home and my school. My parents' home curriculum was purposeful and rigorous, sometimes oppositional to what our teachers were preaching. When the infractions were minor, minor merely matters of interpretation or honest error, then my parents would quietly make the corrections at home. You see, they picked their battles very carefully. But when our teachers said something that my parents considered blatantly misleading or hurtful to their children, especially when they considered the message harmful to all of the children in the class, they would speak up. Since I knew my parents well and knew the things they cared about, peace, justice, fairness, dignity, I would occasionally hide my teacher's bias and prejudice from them. As an adolescent, I didn't always welcome their challenge and their activism on my behalf. The fire and the fury that I had hoped for from my parents in second grade felt intrusive by junior high school when I was determined to define my autonomy and my independence. Everyone believes that parents and teachers should be allies and partners. After all, they are both engaged in the important and precious work of raising, guiding, and teaching children. Whether researchers are identifying the critical variables related to school improvement, or policymakers are writing legislation that embeds the requirements of family engagement in school, or practitioners are preaching about the roots of high student achievement, productive relationships between parents and teachers are seen as necessary and beneficent. But more often than not, the reality of family school encounters is sharply different from the benign rhetoric. In this ritual, so friendly in its apparent goals, parents and teachers are racked with high anxiety. In this scene, marked by decorum, politeness, and symbolism, they exhibit gestures of wariness and defensiveness. In this dialogue, where the conversation appears to be focused on the child, adults often play out their childhood histories, their own insecurities, their own primal fears. In this encounter, where the content seems to be defined by individual stories, there is embedded a broader cultural narrative. The essential conversation then focuses specifically on the drama of the parent-teacher conference, a twice, yearly, a twice yearly ritual that takes place in schools across our country an estimated 100 million times a year, examining the dynamics and paradoxes of this complex relationship and illuminating the ways in which this tiny microcosm of parent-teacher dialogue echoes broader social and cultural themes that shape the socialization of our children. 
I have had a very long fascination with the theater of this essential conversation, with its substance and its symbolism, with its personal and public meanings. As a matter of fact, my very first book, Worlds Apart, published 35 years ago, you're beginning to know my age, was pioneering in its exploration of the bridges and boundaries between the two domains that before that time had been conceptually dichotomized by the social science literature. Researchers studied education in schools or socialization in families as if they were discrete and separable phenomena. I believe that Worlds Apart broke new ground in charting the historical and ins institutional intersections and tracing the ways in which children navigate these overlapping spheres of socialization. In the essential conversation, I was interested in returning to this fertile ground for four reasons. First, because over the years, the educational landscape has changed substantially, creating a different set of conditions that have powerfully reshaped and complicated encounters between families and schools. Second, we know now, based on three decades of rigorous research, that parent participation in support of classroom learning and directed toward the child's academic and curricular experiences in school is a more important indicator of student achievement than the family's racial, social class, or educational background. In other words, parent engagement trumps all the other social indices that are typically correlated with student achievement. My third reason for wanting to revisit this family school terrain is because I wanted to shift my focus from the broader structural intersections to the more intimate and personal encounters between parents and teachers, seeing the complexities and subtleties from the protagonist's point of view as being shaped not only by the institutions they represent, but also by their own histories, experiences, and temperaments. And fourth, as my opening autobiographical reflections suggest, my book is in part an intimate, passionate self-exploration, an opportunity to bring to my analysis of families and schools the subjective filter of being a parent myself, an advocacy stance that inevitably both blurs and illuminates my view. Advocating for my own children, and relating to their teachers has given me insight into how hot and passionate these interactions are, how loaded they are with desire, ambition, and fear, and how shaped they are by the idiosyncratic nature of the individual child and the particular chemistry of the adult personalities. And now I confess that I sit anxiously waiting for my daughter, Talani, to call from Philadelphia to tell me the details of my granddaughter Paloma's first day in first grade. The, general, the generational echoes resounding in my ear. For two years, I traveled around the country talking to dozens of teachers and parents and witnessing their encounters with one another. I visited city, suburban, rural schools, preschools, elementary schools and high schools, public, private, and parochial schools, hoping to capture as much variety as possible in the ways that parents and teachers come together on behalf of their children. I wanted to see the similarities and differences in the tone, dynamics, content, and structure of these ritual encounters when children are at different developmental stages, when there are shifts in demography and geography, and when schools are support, supported by public and private monies and shaped by sacred and secular values. I chose to focus on teachers who are considered by their colleagues, administrators, and parents to be gifted practitioners who are regarded as skilled, empathic, and caring in their dealings with parents. I believe that we can learn a lot more from examining examples of goodness than we can from dissecting weakness and pathology. I also know from decades of doing qualitative research in the field that people 
who are relatively successful and self-confident are more likely to be undefended and revelatory about those aspects of their work that might be regarded as problematic or even underdeveloped. These sturdy folks offer us a more complex and authentic view. From the rich exploration of the tender and treacherous family and school terrain that I examine in the essential conversation, I would like to focus my discussion this evening on three domains illuminated by three parables that are central to shaping the tone, texture, substance of parent-teacher encounters. The first, echoing my opening story, refers to the autobiographical and psychological scripts and the broader historical and cultural narratives that haunt parent-teacher encounters. I call these generational and cultural echoes ghosts in the classroom. The second theme explores the double edge of the ritual conference, where the content can become symbolic or substantive, routine or revelatory, limiting or liberating. I argue that truth and trust between parents and teachers grow out of detailed evidence rather than broad abstractions, out of specific observations rather than pleasant platitudes. And the third and final theme highlights the huge variation in family school negotiations reflecting disparities in power and resources between schools and the communities they serve. The ways in which race, class, educational background, and immigrant status conspire to produce great contrast in relationships that parents and teachers develop with one another. So here is the first parable. Are you with me? Yes? Good. It's called the doorknob phenomenon. The doorknob phenomenon. The parent-teacher conference is over. The father rises to leave and he heads for the door. He touches the doorknob, then turns back abruptly with one final thought that he delivers passionately. And another thing, he blurts out, referring to a topic that was covered earlier in the meeting. That same thing happened to me in fifth grade, and I swear, I swear to you, it's not going to happen to my child. His tone is threatening, his teeth are bared, his anguished outburst surprises even him. His passion explodes in defense of his child and in his own self-defense for the child he once was. Every time parents and teachers encounter one another in the classroom, their conversations are shaped by their own autobiographical stories and by the broader cultural and historical narratives that inform their identities, their values, and their sense of place in the world. These autobiographical stories often unconscious replays of childhood experiences in families and in school are powerful forces in defining the quality and trajectory of parent-teacher dialogues. There is something immediate, reflexive, and regressive for both parents and teachers about their encounters with one another, a turning inward and backward, a sense of primal urgency. The parents come to the meeting, sit facing the teacher in the chairs that their children inhabit each day, and they begin to feel the same way that they felt when they were students, small, powerless. And when the teachers offer observations and evaluations of their students, they are often using values and frameworks carved out of their own early childhood experiences. The adults come together prepared to focus on the present and the future of the child, but instead they feel themselves drawn back into their own past, visited by the ghost of their parents, grandparents, siblings, and former teachers haunted by ancient childhood dramas. These visitations and echoes reverberate through the room, complicating the conversation, and filling the space with voices of people who are not there, people often who are long gone. The doorknob phenomenon 
a typical but surprising aftershock of the visitation of ghosts during the conference is evidence that parent-teacher dialogues are imprinted with ancient psychological themes, that conversations between them reverberate with intergenerational voices, and that part of the power of these ghostly appearances is that they are usually hidden from our consciousness. These generational echoes for both parents and teachers are double-edged. They are a source of both guidance and distraction, insight and bias. They sometimes lead to important breakthroughs and discoveries in the conversation. And at other times, they force an abrupt breakdown or impasse. But for most part, these meta-messages remain hidden, inaudible, unarticulated. What is fascinating about these generational echoes is how deep and penetrating they are, and yet how easily they can be uncovered, given a safe place to talk about their lives and their work, and an attentive, respectful listener who's genuinely curious about their experiences. People discover, often for the first time, the early roots of their current preoccupations and actions. When these long ago tales are uncovered, their power and influence are indisputable. The lessons here are subtle and complex, suggesting both expressivity and restraint. In reimagining and reinvesting in productive encounters between families and schools, we must recognize that the subtext of parent-teacher dialogue is defined by autobiographical narratives and generational echoes. I would argue that communication between parents and teachers is enhanced when there is an awareness of this subterranean content, when the subtext is seen as a legitimate and critical piece of the dialogue. But, and this is a big but, recognizing the ghosts and hearing the haunts does not mean that this ancient psychological material should be the foreground of parent-teacher conversations. <laughs> it must be, after all, a dialogue about the child in the service of his or her learning and development, not about adults making peace with their past. There is a tricky balance here between foreground and background. It demands working to make the unconscious content conscious, but never letting it overtake or overwhelm the focus on the immediate moment in the child's life. One teacher's wisdom changes the metaphor from doorknobs to sound waves and captures the nuance of this balancing act. She says to me, quote, remember that when parents come to school and sit before you, their minds are working on a double channel. And so is ours. On channel one, adults speak ra rationally and clearly about the young person for whom they are responsible. And on channel two, they relive scenes and haunts from their own childhoods. You should be aware, she says to me, of the noise on channel two, but it should never drown out Channel one. Do you get it? I've got to hydrate myself. The second parable, hiding behind the ritual. As he sits in the first parent meeting of the year for his son who is in third grade, Andrew Green tries to push the teacher past her ritualistic reporting past the usual platitudes that tend to define the first cautious encounters. In the opening minutes of the conference, he hears what he already knows and what he expects, and he grows impatient. All they are doing, says Andrew, is hiding behind the ritual reciting of facts. He holds up his hands above his head. They are starting way up here, saying all the stuff that is already observable to me. I'm trying to get them to be more descriptive of what's going on, to move beyond the abstractions and the bland, empty platitudes 
In other words, I want to know what the teacher has observed that leads her to make these judgments. And I want to know how these judgments stack up relative to what set of expectations. Hiding behind the ritual. Parent-teacher conferences are highly ritualized events, and like most rituals, the form and content can become either symbolic or substantive, routine or revelatory, limiting or liberating. In other words, rituals are always double-edged, offering a structure and a routine that can inhibit expression and mask feeling, or providing a framework and safe space for authentic dialogue. In the parable, Andrew Green recognizes both the casualties and the opportunities, and he doesn't want to leave the conference, as he puts it, feeling empty and uninformed. I believe that the double edge of the ritual is magnified in family school meetings because there is so much at stake. For parents, there is nothing more precious or more important than their child. They come to the meeting eager, often desperate to hear good news about their child's life in school, barely masking the fear and trembling in their hearts. And although teachers do not express the same terror as parents do, most will admit that they worry a lot, a lot about conferences, that this is the area where they feel most unprepared and exposed. As one teacher said to me, this is the part of my teaching where I feel the most raw and vulnerable. In addition, teachers receive almost no training or support in developing relationships with the families of their students. Across the country and in a wide variety of colleges and universities, graduate and undergraduate training courses typically do not help students anticipate or prepare for their work with parents. And once new teachers are hired, they're likely to receive little guidance or support or supervision from their administrators and colleagues in this area. They're forced to make it up as they go along, usually relying on perspectives and practices they learned as children watching their own parents and teachers. With little teacher training in this area, with so much at stake on both sides, and with the expectation that conferences are supposed to be relatively pleasant and civilized events, this ritual can often tilt in the direction of form over substance, sentimentality over sympathy, and rhetoric over truth-telling. The ritual becomes an empty, unsatisfying event that avoids talk reflecting the authentic feelings of the participants or talk that might lead to conflict. In fact, I believe that parents and teachers often engage in an implicit and quite subtle bargain with each other. They agree to give up the potential for discomfort in exchange for pleasantries. They agree to not speak their minds in exchange for peace of mind. But the bargain is rarely fully satisfying for either party. Rather than the ease and comfort they bargained for, parents and teachers are left feeling a chronic disappointment, left knowing that they have wasted each other's time and not learned what each other has to offer in support of the child. The wisdom drawn from the experiences of the parents and teachers I spoke with is refreshingly specific and prescriptive, much more straightforward than dealing with ghosts in the classroom. The guidance here is distinctly concrete. A central ingredient of any teacher training curriculum should be learning to work with parents. This includes developing an appreciation for the role and perspective, the cultural values and practices of parents and caregivers. Learning about the broad ecology of education and the place of schools in it. And developing a set of skills and approaches for effective communication and collaboration with families. No conference should be genetic, gen generic, or genetic, but. <laughs> I wanted to write that on a big sign across the highway, right? No, and then I blew it, that line. No conference should be generic. 
one size does not fit all. The conference must be shaped by and focused on the individual child, using specific and descriptive evidence of the student's learning, development, and progress in school. There are at least three specific skills that teachers need in order to do this subtle and highly individualized work. First, they need to be trained in the art of observation. They must learn to see things clearly, notice the nuances of interaction, and learn to read the classroom like a complex cultural text. They must become students, even connoisseurs, of human behavior. Second, they must be trained in the skills of record keeping and documentation. They must develop the daily discipline of note taking and journal writing. They must follow their intuitions and with careful records that either confirm or challenge their earlier suspicions. And third, they must learn to listen, to really hear the voices and perspectives of parents. Just as they need to be able to offer up the specific details of their students' lives in schools, they must be receptive to the parents' stories about their children. Certainly, the, developing the skills of observing, recording, and listening is essential to documenting and articulating the evidence. But there is an art, thank goodness, to this as well, that enriches teachers' communication with parents. When teachers think of themselves as storytellers, searching for the compelling narrative, selecting an anecdote or illustration that reveals a core truth about a student, they're using the modality of an artist as well as the skills of an empiricist. Hearing the story well told, parents can see the general in the specific, and they can also begin to feel identified with that part of their child's experience that resides inside of them. The circle of empathy among teacher, parent, and child is joined. Finally, and this may be the most important and strangely controversial piece of advice I offer you this evening. There is no better, more convincing evidence of a child's progress than to have him or her present and participating when parents and teachers come together. Yes. It is safe to say that parent-teacher conferences that are held without the child being present are excluding the most valuable voice, the most knowledgeable perspective. When children are invited to the conference, however, it is crucial that they be seen as real participants, not passive bystanders, and teachers must help prepare them for their role in the conversation. This is not a practice that should be limited to middle school or high school age students. In my research, I witnessed six and seven year olds holding their own in, three -way in a three-way dialogue with their proud parents and teachers present. With careful coaching from their teacher, they become the interpreters and evaluators of their own experience, and in so doing, the authors of their own stories. The third parable, the final parable, polar opposites. Molly Rose, a first grade teacher, describes the striking contrast between two polar opposite schools as she moved from her first job in Weston, a rich suburban school just outside of Boston, to a brand new dangerously underfunded charter school serving poor black children in Cleveland. The difference in these schools and the communities they served were reflected most vividly in the ritualistic encounters at open house that were scheduled at the beginning of the school year. In Weston, says Molly, open house was a classic event. You know, she says, hoping that the description will strike recognition in me. The classroom looks beautiful, perfectly decorated for the parents. 
I write a script for my opening talk, then rehearse it until I know it by heart, so I won't need to refer to it, so it will appear completely natural. I stand up and present for 45 minutes. The parents listen and take notes. I dread every moment of the evening. They ask some pointed questions, thank me when it's over, leave, and talk about me afterwards. <laughs> In a few short sentences, Molly has captured the tenor of the occasion. So filled with anxiety, tension, and stage fright, so focused on establishing her legitimacy in the eyes of the parents. The open house at the charter school in Cleveland could not have been more different. The school opened a week late that year because the building was not yet ready for occupancy. And the open house took place in a huge empty space that would one day be a combination gym and auditorium. There were no chairs, and the parents arrived with all of their kids in tow. The noise was deafening, ricocheting off the unfinished cement walls. Standing at the microphone, the principal was finally able to bring the room to some semblance of order as she welcomed the families and made a few opening remarks. Her last sentence, however, led to unbelievable chaos. Now, she instructed the parents, you can go and meet your child's teacher. But the parents had no idea where to go. They had not been given a map of the school nor told where their child's classroom was located. So everyone sort of staggered around the halls, frustrated and confused, in search of their children's classroom. Even though Molly had prepared a talk for the parents, she soon realized that it would be absurd to stand up in front of the classroom and try to give a presentation with people floating in and out, tugging noisy, tired children behind them. Now Molly is laughing at herself. The fact that I thought I was going to speak was totally utterly ludicrous. Polar opposites. Molly's memory is one of culture shock as she moved from the rarefied, affluent suburban school where she delivered practiced prose to an elite audience of judgmental parents to a poor, struggling city school where the chaos and confusion of opening night made it impossible for her to offer a proper welcome. As she moved from a perfectly decorated and manicured setting full of shiny desks, modern computers, and the latest curriculum materials, to a room in a converted factory where her classroom supplies consisted of 25 chairs for 27 children, where there were no books, pencils, or paper. Molly's journey highlights the wide variation in encounters between parents and teachers that reflect differences in their race, social class, educational background, and immigrant status. Even though rich and poor children have vastly dis different odds and opportunities in this big, diverse country of ours, I believe that all parents hold big expectations for the roles that schools will play in their, the life chances of their children. We all harbor a large wish list of dreams and aspirations for our youngsters. All families care deeply about their children's education and hope that their progeny will be happier, more productive, more successful than they have been in their own lives. Each generation asks for more. I believe that this is just as true in Cleveland as it is in Weston, despite the huge contrasts in material and cultural resources. And all parents see schools as the primary vehicle for mobility in our society. They see a direct link between their child's achievement in school and his or her chances for a better life. It is fascinating that these large contrasts in power, resources, and knowledge of the system between rich and poor, black, brown, and white, and well-educated and illiterate parents lead to a similar impulse in teachers. In responding to these striking differences in parents' relationships with schools, 
teachers talk about the need to engage in parent education. The curriculum of this parent pedagogy in these very different settings is surprisingly similar. Maria Lopez, a third grade urban teacher in a bilingual classroom, sets up monthly workshops with parents. First generation immigrants from the Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Mexico, and Costa Rica to give them guidance in how to build healthier families, how to problem solve, how to discipline their child, how to communicate with their spouse. She believes that this basic training of parents will have an indirect impact on the acculturation and achievement of their children in school. Likewise, Andrea Brown, a Montessori preschool teacher, describes her bi-monthly workshops with upper middle class white families with whom she works as parent education. Like Maria Lopez, she takes a didactic stance. She reveals her values and she speaks about family issues that she believes are crucial for the optimal emotional and intellectual development of their children. In fact, Andrea makes a clear distinction between the conversations that take place in parent-teacher conferences in which she is unlikely to take a position or preach a set of values, and the exchanges in the parent workshops where she hopes that in making her values transparent, she will encourage parents to scrutinize their own. What is critical in both Maria's and Andrea's pedagogy with parents is that parents are never talked down to, never infantilized or disrespected. Respect is the major ingredient in these encounters, a genuine respect that leads to understanding, empathy, and authentic communication. Andrea and Maria's workshops are designed to empower and inform parents, to share knowledge and strategies with them, to open doors, to offer hospitality, nourish trust, to decrease the inequalities of power between families and schools. These parent education efforts help us realize that effective work with families, particularly those dialogues that cross the boundaries of race, culture, and class, cannot be contained in twice yearly conferences. Parent-teacher meetings need to become more frequent and they need to be supplemented and enriched by other forms of contact and communication with families, including spontaneous exchanges at the classroom door, home visits, family workshops, weekly newsletters, emails, and websites. In fact, as Maria Lopez puts it, with my parents, she says, the conference is definitely not where the action is at. She is speaking here about working with parents who are reluctant to come to conferences, either because they feel impotent, awkward, or out of place sitting in their child's classroom facing the teacher, or because they do not speak the school's language, or because they do not believe their presence will necessarily benefit their child. Maria knows that no begging will make these parents come to conferences, that it is a waste of her energy to even try. So she invents another forum for parent participation, one that she believes is more culturally appropriate, one that appreciates that they need to, in order to become more competent parents, and one that begins to break down the barriers and build bridges between home and school. In Maria's bilingual classroom and in a diverse range of school settings, we recognize the ways in which the typical conference is an unproductive vehicle for building relationships between families and schools. And we see the ways in which resourceful teachers and administrators create other arenas for individual and group conversations. They go to where the action is at. And I know I ended that sentence in a preposition. <laughs> I'm a Harvard professor. <laughs> There's no better way to say it, however. So we come full circle. 
and thank you for your genuine, authentic attention this evening. We come full circle, returning to the opening tales of Mrs. Sullivan and Miss Rogers, my second and eighth grade teachers, and their encounters with my parents. To dialogue spooked by autobiographical ghosts and haunted by the historical and cultural scripts of the 1950s. To rituals full of prophecy, avoidance, and formalism. To distorted and silenced conversations across the chasms of race, culture, and class. The three parables that have framed my talk this evening offer us an interior view of individual stories forged at family school borders and a lens for re-envisioning the layers of meaning and purpose embedded in the talk between parents and teachers. These are the narratives that you all, educators and parents, compose and live every day. In these stories, we witness the agency, knowledge, creativity, and strategy that help to build bridges and nourish relationships. And we also hear the fear, defensiveness, and passivity that lead to asymmetries of power and the marking of boundaries between families and schools. But as you who daily navigate these treacherous waters know better than most, developing productive dialogues on behalf of children takes more than individual initiative, strategy, and goodwill. It also requires that we recognize their wider cultural context, appreciate the broader societal forces that shape and distort our individual actions, that we join analysis, evaluation, and advocacy, and that we participate in efforts to shape good policies and best practices. Our efforts, therefore, must include purposeful change at the micro and macro levels, in the interpersonal and structural spheres, and in the political and cultural arenas. In taking this larger purview, we must confront the institutional structures that inhibit access and equal opportunity. We must challenge the stereotypes and discrimination that render too many people voiceless and invisible. We must scrutinize the cultural priorities that reinforce fierce competition and the harsh paradigm of winning and losing. And we must expose the historical narratives that haunt our contemporary efforts to build a democratic nation. To all of you here this evening, I want you to know that I know that this is big work. This is intellectually discerning work. This is political and strategic work. This is ethical and relational work. Nourishing partnerships and navigating the waters between families and schools requires a delicate and complex balance of bridge building and boundary setting, expressivity and restraint, intimacy and distance, and always, always a mutual respect. It requires a blend of inquiry and intervention, research and practice, empathy and engagement. And of course, it requires a daily vigilance, one that challenges each of us individually and collectively to keep the faith. So let's keep the faith. Thank you very much.